Today we are drinking Jesse James Most Wanted by Aftershock Brewing Company Garage Grade 4 out of 5 bottle caps. This is a very smooth stout, masking an ABV of 12% very well, I might add. And this smooth beer was brought to us by this smooth crew. First up, in the Sunshine State, we have Stephanie and Callie. And next up, we have Alice from Forest Hill over in London. In parts unknown, we have Madeline. She is thanking us for providing a place for all of the true crime geeks. Also, this is very nice. She says her heart belongs to True Crime Garage. Hey, Captain, where's the checklist? Go ahead and make a note that we've acquired one heart. <laughs> uh, too late. I sold it on eBay. We need to keep the lights on. And last but not least, a big shout out and thank you to Stephen in Hatfield, Pennsylvania. Hey, n- not last but not least, a big shout out to the smoothest of the smooth, JT Smooths, the head contractor over in parts unknown thanks everybody for providing the dough for this week's beer run and if you want to donate to the show go to truecrimegarage.com and click on the donate button and if you click on the store page you can see the team nick shirts and you want to pick one of those up today but don't hesitate because as expected they are going fast all right that's enough of the business everybody gather around grab a chair grab a beer let's talk some true crime Let's get into the story that shocked the neighborhood and community. This takes place in Philadelphia back in July 29th of 2000. Mm -hmm. Two young sisters played outside while waiting for their mother to return from across the street with dinner. Ariana DeJesus and her sister had been riding bikes in the neighborhood and enjoying the summer as kids will do. When their mother returned with dinner just a few minutes later, five-year-old Ariana was nowhere to be found. Now, the little girl was reported missing, and the neighbors helped search for the young girl for several days. Well, on August 3rd, the remains of a child were found in an empty apartment building in the family's neighborhood not far from where she was last seen. It was soon confirmed that the body was that of Ariana de Jesus. It was discovered that the young girl had been raped and then strangled before her body was placed in a trash bag and left underneath heavy rolls of carpet in the apartment building. Near the body was a t-shirt with a political logo on it. This t-shirt also contained the blood of the little girl. A resident of the apartment building, this is Jorge Contreras, Mm -hmm. he recognized the shirt as one that he had lent to a homeless drifter known to him only as Carlos. So earlier that same summer, Jorge took pity on this young homeless man. He gave him clothing. He gave him shelter. He even gave him a job to do. He worked at Hunting Park. Uh, Carlos worked there about three days a week. Now, Jorge Contreras, he had to go out of town. This is the weekend of July 29th. And when he went out of town, he gave Carlos a set of keys. This is to an apartment so that he would have access to the building so he could get in there and do some work while the man was away. Now, another girl in the neighborhood would eventually tell police that she had seen Ariana walking with a Hispanic male. This is the evening that she had gone missing and that she was holding the man's hand. They were walking in the direction of the apartment building where the body was later found. After that night, Carlos was nowhere to be found in Philadelphia, nowhere in the neighborhood. A sketch was made of this Carlos, and DNA that was found at the crime scene was entered into a national database. This is the CODIS database in hopes of finding out more about this suspect. Unfortunately, no matches turned up, and tips of the suspect's whereabouts turned up empty. The case soon turned cold. Since he had not been seen since the girl went missing, Carlos then became wanted for questioning. We mentioned the sketch of him as well. This was profiled on the show America's Most Wanted. Mm -hmm. But later police are going to get a huge break in this very tragic unsolved murder. A man named Alexis Flores. He was arrested in Phoenix, Arizona for shoplifting in 2002. Two years later, police came to Flores' residence in response to a noise complaint. While talking to him, He ends up giving the officers fraudulent identity documents. Well, possession of these items in Arizona is a felony. Uh, So he is arrested. And when he's arrested, they noted that his demeanor was welcoming and friendly. Uh, They really didn't have anything bad to say about the guy. He didn't go, you know, he didn't put up a fight when he was arrested. But they ended up searching his apartment after he's arrested for further investigation. 
Officers noticed pornography spread out across the floors. He also had a refrigerator that was fully stocked with Kool-Aid. I wonder what color it was. Well, the officers noted in their police report the items that they found to be strange in his apartment. Now, on both of these charges, both the shoplifting and the forgery or the fraudulent identity documents charge, he is arrested and convicted on both of these charges, right? Mm -hmm. Well, the forgery charge from 2005 is a felony. So because of this, they took his DNA at that time. He served 60 days for this felony charge in 2005. Now, Flores was deported to Honduras. Uh, this is where he told police that he was originally from. It wasn't until the following year, this is in 2006, that Flores' DNA was added to CODIS, or the Combined DNA Index System. So CODIS is a generic term used to describe the FBI's support program for criminal justice DNA databases. In 2007, a positive match was made between his DNA and the sample that was found way back when at the apartment building where Ariana was killed. And I'll post a picture of Flores, but uh, he has black hair, brown eyes. He's about 5'4", so pretty small, 130 to 140 pounds. He's, he's slim, a mm -hmm. light complexion. He also has a scar on his forehead and right cheek. Well, after the DNA match was confirmed, an arrest warrant was issued by the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania charging Flores with murder. Now, in June of 2007, the Federal Bureau of Investigation added Flores' name to the most wanted list in an effort to catch the suspect in this grisly murder of a young Pennsylvania girl. Flores replaced Shante Henderson on the list. This was an alleged Kansas City gang member who was caught on March 31st of that year. Now, the same day she was placed on the list was the same day she was apprehended. So he replaces her, and now they're offering a $100,000 reward for information that leads to the capture of Alexa Flores. The thing here is, though, uh, authorities do believe that Flores is probably still living in Honduras, where they sent him back to after he committed the felony. Right. Um, but regardless, you know, we saw the situation yesterday when we talked about Van Wees. You know, we were able to get him extradited back from Mexico so he could finally serve out that that prison sentence that he deserves for murder. And the uh, the authorities here are very they're still very determined to bring him to justice for the murder of a little girl. And as always, when we see with these predators, these people that rape and kill the concern, a big concern, and this should be a concern for the people of Honduras. Right. You know, this is why you want to get this guy out of your country. Do you want to? Is that what you want to tell your people that, you know, we understand that you're from this country. You go off to another country and you commit horrible acts against very innocent people against children. Yeah. And then guess what? You can just come back here and we will house you and you won't ever have to see, you won't ever have to serve punishment or jail time for your crimes. That's not what you want to tell your people. You know, I think that I think regardless if you agree with our punishments or, or our prison system or, or the, the structure of society that we've created here, mm -hmm. I think you tell your people, you know what, if you do the crime, you're going to have to go back to that place and you're going to have to face trial. He raped his victim. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to I'd put money on the fact that this was not his first victim as far as a sexual assault goes. So you have that threat. You know, it's not just the murder threat uh, of somebody or a child in Honduras. We have sexual assault threats that, you know, and that needs to be taken very serious. Yeah. And I mean, who, who knows? Maybe Kool-Aid is his beverage of choice. I don't know. Everybody enjoys a nice glass of Kool-Aid every now and then. <laughs> what are you getting but, at with Kool-Aid? But I'm just saying that it's, it seems like it would be something that you would use to lure a child or a young potential victim with, you know? So it, it to me, I feel like we have a guy here that is, is extremely so dangerous. You, oh, right, right. So you're just assuming that, you know, this guy that he has Kool-Aid for children. That that is my assumption, yes. I was just going to assume that he has it because he's, you know, a thirsty man. Well, but also it's cheap. Mhm. Mm so we just lost our Kool-Aid sponsor. Yeah, I just to me this guy just just screams danger and I think that regardless of where he's hiding, they should be happy to send him back here to face trial. Well, and this is kind of deceiving, you know, his age is a little deceiving because he he is so small. Yeah, and so he's he, got he, a very young-looking face. Yeah, I mean, he looks uh, 
in the one picture, I mean, he looks 12. Um, so I think that's going to be hard for people to identify this individual. Well, just a couple notes of the most wanted poster featuring Flores. Uh, you know, he's gone over, he's gone by several different aliases over the years, but more importantly, you know, we're, we're noting how young he looks He's also given several different birth dates over the time, and they don't seem to be 100% convinced of where he was born. Right. Let me read those off. So he states that he was born in 1975, Mm -hmm. 1982, 1980, and then again, 1982. Mm -hmm. So, you know, he's going to be 35 to, you know, 40 years old. If any of those dates are correct at all. Or 42 years old. So, and he and like I said, in the one picture he looks like maybe twelve, mm-hmm. and the other picture maybe sixteen, seventeen. So, who knows? Yeah, and the other thing, make sure you go to fbi.gov/wanted. Check out the pictures of all these individuals that are wanted by the FBI. Who knows? Maybe you can help in one of these cases. Now, this next case here, Captain, is one that has been featured on. You know, yesterday we talked briefly about unsolved mysteries and America's mm-hmm. Most Wanted. This one has been featured on both of those shows. Uh, this Our story takes us back to March 2nd, 1976, and this starts in a wooded swamp area off of North Carolina Highway 94, which is about five miles south of Columbia, North Carolina. Now, around noon that day, you know, out in this area, this is a heavily wooded area, so they have these forestry towers. Yeah, I know. I've seen Dawson's Creek. Yeah, so with these towers, Captain, they are looking for anything that could go wrong in the area. Well, on this day, around noon, they spot a fire, which is a big concern out here because this mm-hmm. could quickly turn into a forest fire. So they send a, uh, they dispatch a ranger out to the area where the smoke is rising from the trees. Right. The fire had started to spread a little bit by this time, by the time the ranger arrived. But once he was there, he discovered a hole. Somebody had dug a hole. And what he first thought was burning in the hole was an animal carcass. Well, he puts out the fire and he then can see that there is a shoe sticking out of, uh, out of these burned charred remains that are in the hole. Mm -hmm. Well, he gets police out there and they look through the area and they pull a body out of the hole. Well, underneath that body is another one, and then another one, and then another one. Unfortunately, they end Three. up finding five total bodies five in this bodies. hole. And they said that it, it got so traumatic to the officers there that every time they pulled one out, they were praying that they would see the bottom of this hole. Now, the hole was quite wide, and it was about three foot deep. But the way that the officers described it was that somebody had simply dug this hole, Mm. filled it with these bodies. They also found a gas can and a shovel there. And they must have just tossed, you know, doused it with gasoline, lit it on fire and took off. Now they stated that the area itself was only about a mile away from one of these forestry towers. So whoever set this fire, they didn't leave that scene too, too much earlier than these guys had arrived to find what was burning. Right. So they almost ran into the suspect. Correct. And the thing here is, like we said, they got immediate problems with this crime scene and with the victims. And that being one, that the victims are so badly burned that they can't identify them. Right. Okay. And then second of all, they don't have anybody missing. They don't have anybody as reported missing, let alone five people, five Mm -hmm. people that might have been traveling together. They might live together or they might be unknown to one another. Who knows at this point? So the, the problem is we've got to figure out one, who is in this, who was in this hole and two, who put them there. So back then, you know, we have, you know, it's not the same landscape as it is today regarding detective work. So back then they had to do, they had to hit the pavement and these guys, I, my hat is off to them because they hit it pretty hard. That's what she the said. The only clue that they found at the scene was the gas can and was the shovel. Mm -hmm. Now on the shovel, there was like, there was a bit of a a price tag, you know, like a, maybe half of a price tag on there and they could make out the letters O C H. And then there's a space H D W. So back then they're looking for a hardware store, right? Mm -hmm. And their thought is, well, there's no hardware store in this area that ends with the letters O C H. 
So two investigators hop in a car and they start driving and they go from town to town. And while they're, you know, they have people at their office contacting police departments in the surrounding areas, asking simple questions like, is there a hardware store in your neighborhood or in your neck of the woods with, with that would end in OCH. Right. And nowadays they can just go back to their desk and Google this. Mm-hmm. They're out driving for quite some time and they make it all the way up to the Washington DC area. And once they're there, they are told by the police department there that there is a, a hardware store in a suburb of this area that is called POC hardware store. So P O C H. Yeah. And they're going to talk to the people in the hardware store, but they're not going to be able to tell them who bought this item again because it's, you know, 76, right? Mm -hmm. Uh, they don't have these records. They can't just pull it up on their database, especially if it was a cash purchase. Right. In my local town, like late eighties, early nineties, when you'd go to the hardware store, they would do handwritten receipts. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, couldn't imagine what their system was. Right. You'd be, you'd be searching through boxes of piles of receipts, trying to come up with a name. Um, so the investigators, they don't really know what to do with this lead. They, they feel confident that they've traced the shovel back to where it was purchased from. Mm -hmm. However, so they don't really know what else they can do in this area. They decide that what they're going to do is they're going to place a poster in the hardware store. That's saying that, you know, we have some missing persons that were found and deceased in North Carolina mm -hmm. and we need your help. If you know anything, if you've seen anything, let us know. I guess on this poster, you know, we have five victims, but they only put four victims pictures on there okay. um, because one of them was so badly burned that it might have been either horrifying to look at or of no useful help at all. Um, well, I'm sure they're not putting pictures of the burnt bodies on there. They had to. They didn't know who these people were. Wow. So they're posting in public. Mm -hmm. Ah, man, that would be... Char charred victims. Can you imagine you're just going, you know, going to get charcoal? That's bad. Oh. Uh, if you're going to go get uh, um, some mulch or something, and then you have to, you see this photo, mm -hmm. I'm scared. You know, think about all the kids that walk by that. Well, according to police reports, this would be about a week later on March 10th. There was a neighbor. Uh, he lived in the neighborhood in a neighborhood in Bethesda. Now he grew concerned about the family next door, about their absence, claiming that, that he had not seen them for about a week. So this neighbor contacted the local police who dispatched a detective to the home. Now, after meeting with the neighbor who had a key to the home, mm -hmm. uh, the detective used the key to get into the home to see if anything was wrong. As he approached the front door, he found blood droplets on the front porch, and he entered the home only to discover that there was blood spatter everywhere. It was on the floor. It was on the walls. It was in the bedrooms. Uh, some of it even covered the ceilings. Right, and the blood on the porch gives the officer probable cause. Yes, this detective stated that in his 12 years as a police officer, and still to this day, um, this was the worst crime scene he had ever observed. Now, whose home was this? This was the home of the Bishop family. Uh, this was a family of five, plus uh, we have Brad Bishop. He's the father. His mother lives there with the family as well. Well, it doesn't take too long, Captain, for them to figure out who was in that hole. Because using dental records, they confirmed that the bodies found in North Carolina were that of Bishop's wife, his mother, and his three sons. And our target suspect is going to be, obviously, the father, William Bradford Bishop Jr. We'll get back to this after a quick beer break. Oxygen has a new six-part investigative series coming to television on Saturday, August 19th, called The Disappearance of Natalie Holloway. Natalie Holloway was an 18-year-old girl who vanished from the island of Aruba while she was on her high school graduation trip in 2005. Her disappearance has made international headlines and has remained one of the biggest unsolved cases in the past century. And now the disappearance of Natalie Holloway's investigative series is attempting to get to the bottom of this case and bring Natalie's family justice once and for all. Follow Natalie's father, who has never stopped searching for answers, as he travels back to Aruba to track what he believes 
is the most credible lead in 12 years. And learn from a new informant who has come forward claiming to know where Natalie's remains are buried. This could be the final chapter in a decade-long pursuit to uncover the truth about Natalie Holloway. I'm not going to miss this, and you shouldn't either. The Disappearance of Natalie Holloway premieres Saturday, August 19th at 9, 8 central on Oxygen, the new network for crime. You know, Captain, I love the people over at HelloFresh because they are on a mission to save home cooking. That's because it's just too good to go away. What is HelloFresh? Well, HelloFresh is a meal kit delivery service. They focus on making cooking more fun so you can enjoy the whole experience, not just the final plate. And they fancy themselves a farm-to-box company because they want everyone to have access to fresh ingredients that inspire great meals. HelloFresh currently offers customers a classic box, a veggie box, and a family box. Customers can order three, four, or five different meals per week designed either for two or four people. New recipes are created every week. HelloFresh's recipes will make you feel unstoppable in the kitchen, and your taste buds will thank you. HelloFresh also employs two full-time registered dietitians on staff who review each recipe to ensure that it's nutritionally balanced. HelloFresh delivers food to your doorstep in a recyclable, insulated box for free. That's We like that. Don't litter, my friends. They've made it easy for me to become a great chef because with just six easy-to-master steps, you get to chopping, zesting, and cooking like a natural. And you know what I like to do afterwards, Captain? Pour a little glass of wine because these recipes take just 30 minutes and require minimal equipment. Check out HelloFresh today and use our promo code GARAGE30. And what you'll get is $30 off your first week of HelloFresh. Visit HelloFresh.com and enter our promo code GARAGE30. Madison Reed is the best way to get your hair did. It's the best way to treat yourself. Madison Reed is a company that is revolutionizing the way women color their hair. For decades, women only had two options. You had the one option, go to the salon, spend a bunch of money, leave with empty pockets, right? Or you could do the at-home hair coloring, but normally the quality from your you know, local grocery store or convenience store, the dye that they're selling, it's just not up to par. Madison Reed believes women deserve better than the status quo. Madison Reed is the ultimate hair color hack. You get the quality of the salon color with the convenience and affordability of at-home hair color. Experience beautiful multi-dimensional hair color made in Italy, delivered to your door on your schedule for under $25. Join the hundreds of thousands of women who have tried and loved Madison Reed. Find your perfect shade at madison-reed.com. Madison Reed would like to honor True Crime Garage listeners with 10% off plus free shipping on their first color kit with promo code GARAGE. That's madison-reed.com and use that promo code GARAGE to get 10% off and free shipping on your first color kit. All right, we're back. Cheers, mates. So who is William Bradford Bishop Jr.? Well, he goes by Brad Bishop. And he's a pretty accomplished man by the time of 1976. Uh, he has he has graduated from Yale. He also has a master's degree in in Italian from Middlebury College. Um, so this is a, a well schooled, well educated man. Yeah, it lists that he speaks five languages, and that he also his occupation was United States government foreign service officer. Yeah, and before he worked for the U.S. State Department. He spent four years in the U.S. Army where he worked in counterintelligence. Um, So this is a guy that has a bit of a unique background. Well, he spent a lot of time working, as the captain had said, in the U.S. Foreign Service. This was for many postings overseas. Uh, Some of the postings included Italian cities. um, And he was, I mean, he was well-traveled, well-educated. The thing here is, Captain, when he was working for the U.S. State Department, they have a, a bit of a, a situation where it's like this. It's an up or out situation, meaning that you either keep getting promoted year after year to new job assignments, or once you stop receiving these promotions, well, you get fired. You get let go. Right. This is the same thing I've been trying to tell you about the garage. I mean, if you don't take the, the position of colonel, 
we're going to have to get rid of you. Well, I've applied, and there are several people that will vouch <laughs> for my. Uh, you have not applied ability. You have not applied. You keep denying the request of Colonel. You know what? I tell you what, Captain. There's only two of us here in the garage, so I really think my best ability is my availability. So <laughs> I'm here. I should get the job. The thing here is, Captain. So. He, by this point in 1976, he's no longer working overseas. When he worked overseas, his family was there with him. And it's a, it's a much different lifestyle when you're at these different postings in other cities throughout the world. You know, you receive a whole bunch of privileges. And on top of that, you get your regular salary, but you're also, you basically have no cost of living. You know, they're providing housing for you, transportation, things of that nature. So when you have to come back and start working in the United States, you still collect your salary, but now you have to pay for cost of living. And this guy, he liked to live a bit of a lavish lifestyle when he could. Mm -hmm. He got used to that overseas. So back in the United States, um, they take in his mother, who's living with them. And maybe from the outside looking in, it looks like you're doing something nice for your mother. You know, she has a place to stay and you're helping her out. But one thing investigators were able to figure out was that the situation wasn't quite that. Mom was really helping out more than what Brad was helping out. Mm -hmm. Okay, so mom is not only helping with the children and cooking meals and things like that, but she's also helping the family financially. Well, in early 1976, Brad Bishop, he was anticipating a promotion at work. Remember, we said this is an up or out program. And on the afternoon of March 1st, 1976, he actually learned that he was not going to receive the promotion that he had sought. After learning this uh, information, his coworkers would say that he seemed extremely angry. Um, and he told his secretary that he was not feeling well and he left work early that day. Now, just outside of the building in which he worked, he came across one of his coworkers and his coworker said to him, Hey, Brad, you know, what's wrong? You look like you've lost your last friend. And Brad says to his coworker, he says, you know, well, it's official. I didn't get the promotion that I was looking for. His coworker says to him, well, I didn't get the promotion I was looking for either. Mm -hmm. And he says, you know, Brad, just take it easy. You should just go home, try to get some sleep. Tomorrow's a new day. Give me a call next week and we'll try to figure something out. Well, Brad is a bit of an arrogant dude. Oh, his name's Brad. And Brad says to his coworker, um, you know, I know you didn't get your promotion, but I was much more deserving of the promotion that <laughs> I was seeking. So the coworker says, unfortunately, he never heard from Brad Bishop again. More well, fortunately, he didn't. Police have figured out that after he left that day from the U.S. US State Department headquarters, mm -hmm. he went to a bank where he withdrew several hundreds of dollars. He then drove to a Montgomery Mall and bought a sledgehammer and a gas can at the Sears. From there, he filled. He went to a gas station and filled the gas can as well as filling up his vehicle. This is a station wagon. Um, and from there, he drove to Pox Hardware, which this was the time where he uh, purchased the shovel. Right, the smoking gun. Mm -hmm. Well, after this, he returned to his home. And police believed that he would have got there between 7.30 and 8 p.m. After dinner, he and his wife put the children to bed. And after which his wife went into the study and she's working on some correspondence and such. And his mother decided to take the family's dog. This is a golden retriever for a walk. Well, while his mother is gone on the walk, Brad, he attacks his wife in the study and this sledgehammer, we said he bought a sledgehammer, but it's not, you know, the big long handled sledgehammer. It's, it's got the sledgehammer head with a tr more traditional, uh, handle of a hammer. So mm -hmm. it's a handheld deal. And he attacks her in the study. They could f determine this by the amount of blood that was found in the study. They believe that after he had killed his wife, that he carried her into their bedroom and placed her on the bed and closing the door. He then went upstairs into the children's bedrooms and attacked them as they slept. Now, one of the kids slept in a bunk bed. And so one thing that the police found incredibly disturbing amongst all the blood that was in the house was the number of times that they could tell that when he was pulling the sledgehammer up, that he was hitting the ceiling and, and making marks and holes in the ceiling and the number of times that he had to do that while mm. he killed his child. This is an animal. Mm-hmm. 
Well, his mother would return from walking the dog, and they believed that she must have spotted some of the blood because she apparently tried to lock herself in the bathroom to get away from Brad. Well, Brad, he kicks in the door, um, and it's not so easy. You know, he really had to beat down this door to get into the bathroom, and there he killed his mother. From there, they believe that he cleaned himself up, that he took a shower, maybe a change of clothes, and then he loaded all of the bodies of his family into the family station wagon. From there, he drove over 275 miles down to that spot in North Carolina, where on the next day, he dug the shallow hole and he piled the bodies into the hole and doused them with gasoline and set them ablaze. It seemed like he had a definitive plan. Yeah, here's the thing, Captain, and this is one thing I found it's extremely interesting, was investigators wondered why he wouldn't have just buried his family. You know, because they state that, yeah, at some point we would have noticed that this empty house, you know, there was nobody in this house anymore and we have some missing persons, but this was, well, a, we have tons of blood. Yeah. But the thing here is he could have eventually cleaned up that house. Mm -hmm. uh, any number of things could have happened and they just really wonder why he didn't bury them because they really believe given the location that he chose to set this fire, that they may have never found the bodies of his family. Right. And in an interview, remember I said this was covered on Unsolved Mysteries and America's Most Wanted. Uh, and later, it was covered on The Hunt, you know, the, the John Walsh show. Right. And on that show, they had an interview with the psychiatrist that, that said, you know, for, in his opinion, for Brad killing his family, his family, the murders didn't stop when they were dead. For, for Brad, the murder stopped after he drove the bodies out into the woods dug the hole and set him on fire and almost the, the, his, the, mm. w because he's such a psychopath and it, that he was such a narcissist that he believed that these people were holding him back, that he couldn't live the life that he wanted to live because of his family. And right. the, the psychiatrist believes in his opinion that the murders weren't over until he set that fire and somebody found the bodies of his family. Yeah, well, like I said before, this, you know, Brad is an animal. Mm -hmm. But um, what made him that way? I don't know. I mean, look, he was in the service during the Vietnam War. What testings were being done? Right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I, th I think, you know, he was, uh, you know, a spy at, at one point, right? Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, what was done to him? Was it as simple as this guy was a psychopath and he didn't get a promotion and that made him snap and then he killed everybody in his family? You know, or was there something deeper that happened? Yeah, and he was on some medications for some um, for some mental illnesses, let's say. Mm -hmm. um, they also believe that he may have suffered from some form of insomnia. Uh, but regardless... Oh, yeah, because, you know, when you can't sleep... You just kill everybody in your family. Right. I don't, I don't want to make it sound like we're sympathizing for this guy. You know, this guy clearly could not handle the stresses in his life that was brought upon by his own choices that he made in life. Maybe his choices. I'm just saying, look, you know, you like we said, he speaks five languages. Mm -hmm. he, he's, you know, overseas doing uh, intelligence work. Uh, what, 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 what did this guy go through? Mm -hmm. I'm just saying like, I, I think the how this individual got to this point uh, to to be able to kill uh, not only his wife but his children and then his mother. I mean, you have to. What did you go through? I think that that's the mystery to me. Right, because we all want to know why when something that like this happens. I mean, this is one of the most horrible things you can think of. You want to know why? How the hell did it get to be this way? I mean, we we may never know. We may never know, but, but I will throw out there this, you know, you have other options. You can just walk away. You can just walk away and not, you know, end the lives of these people that are supposed to be your loved ones. Right. But it's, sometimes it's not that simple. And that's all I'm saying is we don't know what this individual went through. I'm not trying to sympathize with them, but you know, there was a lot of testing done with, you know, LSD, for example, you know, you, you do these kind of testings right on these individuals and we, they did it with, um, they did testing on Ted Gazinski, 
and look what happened there. Mm -hmm. You know, so there is a consequence if they're running these tests. I'm just wondering if he was a part of that because it seems like in his professional life, that's the uh, community he was surrounded by. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but I mean, I I get it. I get, and I have no evidence of that. Right, obviously. I get what you're saying. I think I get. I guess what I keep going back to is the cowardliness of killing these people, ambushing them, and then you. He didn't even bother to take his own life. You know, he he clearly valued his own life much well, more that than we know of than than theirs. And he chose instead of walking away, he chose to kill them and then walk away. Well, let's get back on the trail of Brad Bishop uh, real fast here. Uh, so they believe the police believe that, uh, and later confirmed this, that that same day that he lit the fire, that Bishop visited a sporting goods store in Jacksonville, North Carolina. Uh, there he used a credit card to purchase some tennis shoes. They believe that because of, you know, digging the hole and all the work that he did up in those, uh, up in that forested area, mm -hmm. that he was in need of some new shoes. Now, the strange thing here is according to one witness, there were, there were several people that had seen him at the sporting goods store, but according to one witness, he had a fan, he had the family dog with him on a leash and was possibly accompanied by a woman described as dark skinned. Mm. Um, this would be the only report of seeing him with, uh, with a woman. So it might just have been somebody walking near him. I don't know the details of that eyewitness account. Um, now we have on March 18th, the Bishop family car, that was the station wagon that we had mentioned. It was found abandoned in an isolated camping ground in Tennessee. This is in the great smoky mountains national park. Uh, the car contained dog biscuits, a bloody blanket, a shotgun, an axe, a shaving kit, and it also contained his the medication that he was on at the time. Mm -hmm. The spare tire well in the trunk of the car was full of blood. This is where he had stacked the bodies uh, when he was transporting them. Now, according to witnesses there, uh, the car had been there since approximately March 5th or 6th or 7th. They couldn't narrow it down, but they believe that it could have been there as early as March 5th. Police theorized that Bishop from there would have left on foot on the Appalachian Trail. Right, but that's that's not an easy trail to to manage. Mm -hmm. I mean, people planned that out for years and years to go through that trail. Well, while they were there, after finding the vehicle, they decided that they were going to try to track uh, Mr. Bishop using bloodhound dogs. Mm -hmm. um, they were unsuccessful in their attempt. Now, on March 19th, uh, a grand jury indicted Bishop on five counts of first-degree murder and several other charges. And obviously, they have plenty of evidence for these charges. And there were some sightings of uh, Brad after this as well. Yeah, there were a lot of sightings of him and a few that they list as credible. Um, but one thing here, Captain, the the police have an uphill battle. I mean, mm -hmm. I'm not suggesting that they're not intelligent, but we're dealing with a, a man of a certain high intelligence here. Also, you know, with the ability to speak many different languages, he can fit in, you know, in different localities all over the world. It's not that he's like some genius, but he was also trained by our government mm -hmm. and counterintelligence. Have you? Right. And the thing here is Bishop had approximately one week of advanced time before the authorities began looking for him. And during that time, he could have even used his passport to travel outside of the U S you know, keep in mind the methods of air travel and immigration back in 1976 and throughout mo much of the world. Mm hmm were much different back then. He could have easily traveled and avoided leaving a paper trail of any kind. Right. My now, name is Frank Abenale. And like you had said, Captain, uh, Bishop had been cited a number of times in various European countries over the years, and there were a few credible sightings. Um, and of those, let's go through those real quick. In July of 1978, a Swedish woman uh, who said that she had worked with Bishop while on a business trip in Ethiopia. Mm -hmm. uh, she reported having spotted him twice in a public park in Stockholm, Sweden, uh, during a span of one week. She stated that she is absolutely certain that the man she saw in the park is Brad Bishop. Now, let's fast forward to the following year. In January of 1979, 
Bishop was reportedly seen by a former U.S. State Department colleague in a restroom in Sorrento, Italy. Um, the the colleague the colleague spoke to him. Uh, I've heard an interview with mm. this guy, and he says, you know, this is a. It, it, an old dude. I like these old timers. He says, this is an old dude. He's an old dude, man. He's, he's probably in his late seventies by now. Right. It's strange enough. This is the same guy that saw Brad Bishop when he found out he was not getting promoted. Oh, the guy that wasn't as qualified. As right. That Brad told him you, you're less deserving than right. me. You don't deserve this. So in his interview, he starts off the interview by saying, you know what? I don't, I don't normally speak to people in men's restrooms. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's kind of an old dude thing. But anyway, he says that he went into the restroom. I don't like to do that either. And there's a, you know, there's a dude standing there. And of course he's got to, you know, you got to get up on the wall and sometimes you have to stand next to somebody. And so he's standing next to him and he's, he looks over and he, he said the guy is, has Why a the long face. He has a beard. Wow. And he said, you know what? Immediately when I looked at the guy, even after, you know, after several years, he goes, I knew right away who this was. Right, because he's the asshole that told you that you weren't qualified. Yeah, you never forget that face. Yeah, you don't forget an asshole. Beard or no beard. So he says to the guy, he, he just says, you're Brad Bishop, aren't you? Right. And he said as soon as the words came out of his mouth that the man started shaking. And mm. he, and he kind of jumped back and he, he shouted out something and he ran out of the restroom. Well, he tried to follow him, and he eventually this guy that he believes to be Brad Bishop took off and ran down an alley. Now, we also have a situation. This is some real Jason Bourne stuff right there. Yeah, we have this situation in 1994, September 19th, 1994. Uh, this is in Switzerland uh, on a train, and a person who had known Bishop mm -hmm. and his family back from B Bethesda was on vacation in Europe and reported that she had seen Bishop uh, just a few feet away from her on the train. Mm -hmm. And she stated that uh, that Bishop appeared to be well-groomed uh, at the time so of this he didn't have site. a beard. He, he went through his beard phase. He got rid of the beard. Well, he's probably, you know, could be changing his appearance, you know, constantly during his time on the run. So, I mean, it's most likely that uh, Brad Bishop is in the U.K., well, it's somewhere in Europe is what I think that they're stating here. Um, a, a quick little profile here, Captain. The FBI mm -hmm. states that Bishop was an avid outdoorsman who enjoyed camping and hiking. He does have a pilot's license. So not only does he speak all these different languages, he has the ability to fly. Um, he also has a six-inch vertical scar on his lower back from a surgery. <laughs> I thought you were going to say six-inch vertical leap. I was like, he, what, what does that have to do with anything? He has a cleft chin, and he has a mole on the left side of his face. Now, police believe that Bishop uh, left with his passport. They found all of the other passports of his family in their home. They did not find his. Uh, mm -hmm. They also believe that he would have had his Yale-class ring with him when he vanished. Who knows if he still would have this to this day. Now, fugitive status, the police, they believe as of 2010 um, that he was still alive, possibly living in Switzerland, Italy, or some other location in Europe. Now, here's a weird thing that they kind of throw in here with really nothing to back it up. They say that he still might be in the United States, possibly in California, where if, if this were to have been him, that they believe he may have worked as a teacher at some point and possibly have been involved in more criminal activities. It's weird. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, nothing really to back that up. It but seems like there's a lot more to back up the the thought that he could be in Europe somewhere. It would be easier to teach over there. I mean, we got a guy that's fluent in multiple languages for him to be able to go. I mean, they'll take non-college gra graduates and teach English over there sometimes. So I could see that being a possibility. But, you know... The, th the thing about William Brad Bradford Bishop is um, he, he'd be in his 80s. Yeah, so he, he would be uh, he would be roughly 80 years old. Yeah, right. So if he did not kill himself, if uh, these sightings were accurate uh, and he lived, you know, life outside of this uh, crime, uh, he's probably dead or going to be dead soon. Uh, yes. So. Um, I, I don't know that this, this 100% rules out, you know, possibility of suicide or if he was killed in another way, but 
During the time of their investigation in the mid to late seventies, they were checking any unidentified male bodies in the area. Um, and they confirmed, they couldn't confirm any of them to be that of Brad Bishop. There was a situation in 2014 where there was an unidentified man who had been killed uh, in a hit and run situation in Alabama. Um, and they had checked his body to see if he would be Brad Bishop. And of course that was not the case. Now for a little more, uh, information on Brad Bishop, of course you can go to fbi.gov slash wanted. Now on there, they have a 2014 age progression sculpture. Um, this was requested by the FBI and a forensic artist uh, created this sculpture. And so it's you hideous. Can, it, it's, it, it, I mean, not the work itself. It's great work, but this guy becomes hideous. Yeah, and this would be uh, him projected. His projected appearance in this sculpture would be at the age of 77. And FYI, this show was not sponsored by uh, FBI.gov slash wanted. Just to let you know. Yeah, we keep saying that, but we, we're just hoping that people will check that website, you know, periodically. Check it out, you know, from yeah. time to time. Remind yourself that there are people out there that need uh, to be apprehended. They need to be questioned. They need to be brought to trial. Um, and we can all certainly do our part. We've seen the high success rate that the FBI has had using the public's assistance. So uh, we're all in this together. Well, we used to be in this together with you, but this, you know, the garage and parts unknown is you know, move up or move on. So, uh, you'll be moving on. <laughs> oh, it's been real. Uh, well, the, thanks for joining us in the garage uh, for the last, uh, 131 episodes oh, as of God. today. All right. Well, we need to wrap this one up. Yeah. So how about a little recommended reading here, captain? Yes, sir. This week we recommend who killed Bob crane, the final close up by John hook. Uh, Bob crane is best known for his performance as Colonel Robert Hogan, on the old show, the old CBS show, Hogan's Heroes. Uh, the season, the series aired from 1965 to 1971, but on the afternoon of June 29th, 1978, mm -hmm. uh, Crane's co-star, Victoria Ann Barry, entered his apartment after he failed to show up for a lunch meeting and discovered his dead body. Now, Crane had been bludgeoned to death with a weapon that was never identified though investigators believed it to be a camera tripod. Mm. An electrical cord had been tied around his neck. Uh, his murder remains unsolved. There was an arrest. Police arrested Crane's friend, John Carpenter. The two, the two friends had a weird, dark obsession. This was videotaping mm. women during sexual encounters. Carpenter went Jesus. to trial but was acquitted. So mm. now we're left asking who killed Bob Crane? Was it Carpenter or was it someone else? So check well, out. And this is not John Carpenter, the Halloween John Carpenter. Not the famous John Carpenter. This, right. is, this is some hanger on that was well, this friends with Bob Crane. Yeah, John Henry Carpenter. Yeah, so check out Who Killed Bob Crane by John Hook. You can do that by going to our website, truecrimegarage.com. Click on the recommended page. We have that recommendation there as well as all of our others and we have our amazon banner that you can use to pick up any of your favorite true crime books today's show has been sponsored by talkspace the online therapy company for as little as 32 dollars a week get matched with your perfect therapist each and every one of these therapists has at least a master's degree and over 3,000 hours of supervised work start the path to a happier life and you get $30 off your first month and you can show your support to this podcast if you use our promo code garage at Talkspace.com slash garage. Talkspace therapy for how we live today. The Oxygen Channel has a new exciting series about Natalie Holloway, the 18-year-old who went missing in Aruba in 2005. Her disappearance has remained one of the biggest unsolved cases with no real leads in 12 years until now. Don't miss the final chapter in this decade-long pursuit to uncover the truth and bring justice to Natalie's family once and for all. The disappearance of Natalie Holloway starts Saturday, August 19th, at 9, 8 central on the Oxygen Channel. Yes, you definitely don't want to miss that. I'm looking forward to that. I am too. All right. So if you haven't got a Team Nick shirt, I tried to get him to do the Team Colonel shirt, but he was, you know, he kind of was lame. <laughs> Mr. Lamo. He was Colonel Lame Pants. Hey, it's all about me. I wanted to see my hey, name Mr. on the Clean shirt. Hey, Mr. Clean Pants. Why hey, are your pants so clean? Real quick, Captain, a word to the wise. 
We want to tell everybody that all the people that love True Crime Garage, make sure you subscribe to the show mm-hmm. because we've been getting a little, you know, a little willy nilly with the release times and dates of our show. And next week we have a big surprise for you.